and we'll go at mid hold. Hello, everyone. Okay, so I hope you are all here for um, a review and deep dive and hopefully to contribute to um, to the descaling manifesto. Uh, let's see if I can add it all. There we go. I don't have anyone helping me with admissions, so uh, you know what you're in for. If you um, haven't seen this thing before, I'm all surprised. Um, it's kind of new. We've got about 500 signatories so far, but um, this is a living document. And I want you all to think of the souls as, um, see, as, as if you're in the room for the original Agile Manifesto. Uh, so this is not intended to be a session where you throw your hands and I pontificate. This is intended to uh, be something where you go, wait a second, Pete, that doesn't make any bloody sense at all. Um, I should probably give a little introduction for those who don't know me. So I've been involved in Agile since before there was Agile Manifesto. Uh, I spoke at um, uh, XP2. Uh, I'm reading people's hard work. Um, so yeah, I spoke at uh, XP2000 in 2000, about six months before the Snowbird meeting. Um, I coached the second XP program in the world back in 98. Um, these days, uh, I was a working coach for, for about 10 years of my career. Before that, I was a software dude. But these days, uh, my primary focus is uh, a community called the X-Scale Alliance. And that's not to say we think we should have extra scale. It's more like scale with a big X through it. Um, uh, hence, descaling. So uh, the, the basic idea we've got with this, let me do a share screen uh, so that that will be clear if I go like so. Um, that'll work. Let's see if I go share. And then if I go something like this. Okay, there we go. So there's a LinkedIn article on this as well. So if you want to add comments, you can do that. There's a sign up link here. Uh, as I said, we've got about 500 signatories on it at the moment, but um, this is um, not a historical book. Uh, this is intended to be something where we can uh, take a step beyond software um, and draw on more than just um, uh, the history of the Agile movement, because whether you know it or not, there was a pretty strong influence on the original manifesto uh, from something called permaculture, which was created by two countrymen of mine. I'm an Aussie, um, uh, Bill Mollison and Dave Holmgren. Uh, they came up with it in the 70s. We can trace Agile back a lot further than that, 2,000 years back to Lao Tzu, but actually more than 2,000, it doesn't matter. Um, but you can't go and have a chat with Latsu, and we were able to go and have a chat with Dave Holmgren. Uh, Mollison died in 2016. So um, I was kind of anxious about talking with Dave because he's been a hero of mine since I was a kid. Uh, but we, we basically stuck the, uh, let's see if I go back to it. Uh, we stuck this under his nose and said, well, what do you think? We're completely off the beam. And he gave us about two pages of detailed notes on it. And in the end, blessed it and said, as long as we are clear in tracing its affiliation back to his baby, uh, he's all for it. Now, that's a remarkable thing from a permaculture guy because they're very anti-corporate anything. And the intent with this is, this is the work we do as agilists. This is about facing down bureaucracy in the businesses that we work with. So, uh, hang on, I'll get some more people. I don't know why I keep on popping back to that screen. I don't intend it to, but anyway. Okay, 
So, to set some kind of form around this session, we're recording this. If you don't want to be on camera, please turn off your video. Um, I encourage anyone uh, to duck in with any question at any time. And I'm not going to police the one hour session time that I put on this uh, very much, except that I want to give us some sort of breadth first view of what this is about out in that first hour. But if you want to stick around and contribute ideas back and forth, uh, I am all for us doing that together. And uh, I don't have anything on this morning apart from the session we just did at um, the Meet the Patrons, one of the patrons of the festival, yay. Um, so, um, so if you want to stick around, I'm all for it. Um, any questions yeah. before we start? Yes, sir. Can this uh, NCO's name at the 754 is Sergeant First Class Dodd. Ah, uh, um, now they already have an MSM up and it should be at the G1 level, which covers all that reassignment with the 754. So they couldn't write up another. I don't thing. think that Gary's actually talking about what we're talking about. So I'm going to mute him. Um, I could be wrong. <laughs> so um, uh, anyway, um, uh, if you are having side conversations, you do please be kind to everybody else here and, and mute yourself. Um, so any questions before we get stuck in? I'll take that for a note. Okay, so why do we need some other kind of manifesto? What's wrong with the Agile Manifesto? There's nothing wrong with the Agile Manifesto. It's a beautiful document. Uh, it, um, it had a, a, a revolutionary effect on uh, software culture around the world. Um, I was kind of peeved not to be invited to Snowbird, but I thought Bob doesn't care for me much, that's okay. Um, I didn't write this because I was peeved not to be there. I wrote this because I saw a crying need, and that need is um, best expressed through a number uh, in the largest and longest running <clears throat> survey of the Agile world, the State of Agile survey. And that number has appeared in the last four of uh, those surveys. And the number has to do with the uh, ability of the organizations who answered or whose, whose members answered the survey, the ability of those organizations to respond to changing market conditions. Now, responding to change is one of the original values of the manifesto. But only 5% of the respondents to that survey so that Agile helps their organization respond to changing market conditions. 95% said no. And that is a damning um, uh, stain on, on our success after 20 years of Agile. So what's wrong? Why don't organizations continuously respond to changing market conditions? There's lots of simple things we can point at. But I wanted to get something that we could say, well, rather than picking away at particular frameworks or particular practices, I, I could have a go at scrum masters or product owners or coaches or the boffins, the greasy pole of certification, rather than doing all of that. I thought, well, this is a systemic problem and we can trace it back to the original manifesto. It's not that that manifesto is bad or wrong. It's that it never tried to address this problem. Um, and I see uh, an organization that doesn't respond to changing market conditions. And obviously in the current world, we've got nothing but change, VUCA, everything. Uh, I see such an organization as a bureaucracy. And that's the definition I would give for a bureaucracy. It's any organization that doesn't respond to change continuously. Um, so, where this document came from, um, I have this ecosystem of senior coaches we call X. Um, oh, someone got the feedback going on, I think. Oh, okay. Whoever it is has dealt with it. So, uh, there's about 120 of us involved in X scale alliance. And we got together, we get together on a monthly basis. We have something like what we're doing here. We call it a global extreme tea. Uh, it, it, it's not intended to be something that's uh, closed. It's intended to be something where anyone 
who wants to get involved has a, a path in, but we have a, a common set of ideas that we're sharing. And if you want to hear about that, approach me outside of this meeting, because this is not about X scale or X scale lines. This is about a much more general idea. Um, so in, in the conversations we had, it became clear that we wanted to have a manifesto that was all about values and principles for stopping bureaucracy. That's the problem we want to address here. And we want to inherit explicitly from the Agile Manifesto because Agile gave us a brilliant way for um, teams to self-organize and not just software teams. Uh, a lot of what's there, Sally Alata was talking about this in the, the uh, patron session. A lot of what's there is directly relevant to teams that have nothing to do with software. She comes from Sudan and that's the context that they put all of the Agile Manifesto into. It actually comes as a, as a surprise to them when you say, well, you know, it's not really just about technical from their point of view. Of course, it's not about technical. So uh, what we're interested in here is more than working at a team level, but assuming that we get agile working at a team level, what else is missing? So we tried to put an answer to that in terms of values and principles and practices. We're not gonna talk about the practice patterns that go with this in this session. Next week, uh, I'm running a session on something we call the Camelot model, family model, um, that, that puts some really concrete, practical teeth in this, things you can do tomorrow. But right now we're working breadth first to try and talk at the level of intent. And we probably don't have it right. So even though, yeah, we're drawing on two manifestos, permaculture and agile, we're inheriting from those things. Um, and we've had a bunch of senior coaches trying to discuss this. We've had feedback from uh, boffins in uh, agile and in permaculture. We want your feedback. So anything where you go, eh, I don't know about that one, or uh, you're forgetting something, or actually just the way you phrase that is stupid. Um, let's begin with the, the notion that this is stupid and try and make it better as a living document. We don't want to close the doors and say, right, that's it. That's the manifesto. Um, this is the best we've, able, we've been able to get so far. <laughs> so I, I encourage all of you to um, take it away, think about it. Uh, you can always uh, email me feedback, peter.merrill at xscalealliance.org. Um, there's a LinkedIn page for this thing. If you just go Googling descaling manifesto, you'll find that and you can leave comments there if you'd rather have the conversation in public, which I'm all for. Um, so for today, my notion is to sort of describe what the intents are for each of these things and try and make them a little bit more concrete so that when we get to the session next week around the practices that go with this, um, the folk who come along won't go, huh? what are you even trying to do? This makes sense to everybody so far. <coughs> Take that for a yes. Uh, oh, one other thing, um, and this also came out at the end of the patron session. Uh, the Agile Manifesto was created by a bunch of old white American dudes. And um, a lot of you are not old white American dudes. And so please do consider yourselves as in the room for creating this thing. If you want to sign it, great. If you don't want to sign it, great. But what we want is for you to feel that um, the Agile community in 2021 is yours. Doesn't belong to a bunch of old farts, including me from 20 years ago. Uh, we're alive now. So hold on to that idea with both hands for the rest of the festival and try and emphasize mutual benefit now in this world, which is a very different world to the world we were in 20 years ago. Okay, enough blather, I'll get into it. Um, so we want to extend the values and principles of the Agile Manifesto to stop bureaucracy, We're altering them, but adding on. So at the end of this, we talk about um, treating the Agile Manifesto as closed to modification, but open to extension. And I raised that multiple times with um, the, the boffins who wrote it, um, both before and after it was written. And in the most recent session, uh, we had Ari and Alastair and both of them were content with that idea. So um, I think what we're doing is respectful. But if you feel it isn't, it's my problem, not yours. 
Okay, uh, so um, we've talked about what we mean by bureaucracy. I'll give a couple of quotes. Um, if we think of agile as a revolution, uh, Kafka said that all revolutions evaporate, leaving only the slime of a bureaucracy. Um, you might think of certain frameworks as, or, or, or certification uh, uh, totem poles, greasy poles, as the slime of a bureaucracy. Or you might see that in the organizations that you're working with who have had transformations, which are kind of revolutions, and that have uh, only left slime behind. Um, so if we think that that slime of bureaucracy is, uh, is a problem to solve, that's kind of what we're going at here. Um, there's also uh, Jerry Cornell, the, the late science fiction author died a couple of years ago. Uh, he had a, 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 an iron rule, an iron law of bureaucracy that he put um, in his long running bite column that basically goes in every organization, there are two kinds of people. There are the people who care about the purpose of the organization and try to make that better. And there are people who don't care about that purpose. And his iron law is that all organizations evolve until they are controlled by the second type of people. That might make you feel doomed. Um, there's a beautiful site called uh, The Evolution of Trust by a fellow named Nick Case. If you just go and Google Evolution of Trust, you'll find it. Um, that provides plenty of reasons to think that you're not doomed, we're not doomed, we can do an awful lot to fix bureaucracy. How? Well, let's begin with values and principles and we can talk practices next week. Um, so the first of four values, if we're going to inherit from the Agile Manifest, tell me where they have four values, what are these value statements? Well, well, Peter, yeah, go ahead. I'd just like to note that um, you're still showing the Firefox page of the Xcal Alliance um, in case you are presenting the slides? Yeah, I'm hoping that you can see something that says there's nothing wrong with the Agile Manifesto. Oh, it's correct. Then then it's all then it's all fine. Sorry for yeah. interrupting. So that's just where I'm keeping the current copy. Uh, if you go look on LinkedIn, you'll find there's a page that has all of this and then room for comments. Um, I don't know whether that's the latest version or not. And since I haven't had time to check it, I haven't only just remembered that it's there. Um, go and Google that and do please leave feedback there. Or if you get excited enough, go and sign this. Uh, we will be doing a lot more in the future, but where this manifesto came from was the coaches of the Xscale Alliance over a period of about four months of batting ideas back and forth. So that's how left behind the ears this is. Make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay, so, um, right. Uh, the first of these values, autonomy in alignment over command and control. Those of you who are fond of the Spotify videos um, that uh, uh, Henrik, oh my God, why am I not remembering Henrik's last name? It doesn't matter. Nieberg. Thank you. Uh, Nieberg. Um, uh, Henrik Nieberg put out uh, in 2012 and 14. Uh, you'll know where that kind of idea comes from. But when we look at Spotify, well, we find some useful practices, but not enough to defeat bureaucracy as a whole. And that's kind of why Spotify doesn't really do what Henrik called out anymore. Um, and if you talk to Spotify coaches, they can tell you an awful lot more about that than I can here. But this idea was good. The idea that we have self-organizing teams, beautiful. But if we don't align them so that learning flows between them, then our organizations are never going to be able to respond continuously to changing market conditions, they'll be all over the place and usually they'll get dominated by a hierarchy. So we need a way for learning to flow between these autonomous teams and also up and down that hierarchy continuously. And so that's this idea of autonomy in alignment over command and control, because command and control doesn't do that for us. And I think that's reasonably well proved by that 5% number from the state of agile survey. Everybody okay so far? Yes. Cool. Um, do please unmute yourself if you have anything to contribute. Um, this is not intended to be me gassing on and you sitting and just taking it. Do, do please get stuck in and, and hit me with sticks, um, fire bullets at me and all of that stuff because um, I'm just trying to coordinate and give you the flavor of this thing. Uh, it, it, I expect that you will have better ideas 
and different ideas, and that's all good, and we want to hear from them so that we can form a little learning ecosystem ourselves. Um, I, I define an ecosystem as a network of mutual benefit. And we're coming up to that, so uh, that's what we're trying to do here, and anyway, for the conference as a whole, but best of all. Um, okay. I have a question. Yes, please. Go okay. ahead, Jamie. In the 12 principles of the Agile Manifesto, one of them is the most efficient and effective method of conveying information to and within the development team is face-to-face -face conversation. Absolutely. How do we define face-to-face? -face? I think we are doing it right now since, well, actually you don't have your video on, so I wouldn't say that's face-to-face, -face. but human faces are incredibly useful for understanding context. Um, so I, I like to think that face-to-face -face is something we can do with Zoom. But uh, something like this, where we have so many people who can't see each other's faces, you can't look around the room and understand uh, how people are taking what's being said. And a lot of them are raising eyebrows or winking at each other if they can see each other in a different channel. That isn't face to face. We're missing something. I, I completely get where you're coming from. Oh. So, yeah, but they have a little problem with that particular point on the Agile Manifesto where you're saying you're not altering it. Yeah, I have an issue with that because I've worked with distributed teams back when we didn't have Zoom yes. for quite a few years. Yes. And I'm not sure it interfered with their ability to communicate. I think it's time and motion. Uh, you can certainly do the same things with distributed teams, even by email or, or the other channels that you can via Zoom uh, or having them all in the same room. But how long does it take for everybody to get on the same page and align? I think that's the, the rub. Well, if you're doing it by email, it takes longer. If you're doing it with a, a conference call, even without video. Yeah. And if you're sharing a document, I'm not sure there's a big difference. Uh, it's just a matter of time and motion. The more furblings uh, it takes to get things done, uh, the less continuously we can adapt to change. Sure. Okay, the reason I bring it up as a concern is that right now we're all virtual, we're yeah. remote. Yeah. And I keep hearing a lot of people saying they can't wait till they can get back to face to face because that's when the magic happens mm -hmm. or something like that. And yeah. I just don't, I, to me, that's very 20th century of them. Yeah, I agree with you, but I'll add a little something if I can do a yes and. Um, one of the things we focused on in uh, X scale is the idea of, um, and it goes with descaling, is the idea that small groups of people have a much easier time self-organizing than big groups of people. So what we really want to do is find a way to um, get all of our meetings to have small scope. And we've got a model for this where we, even in the biggest organization you can think of, we never wind up with meetings that involve more than six people. And that accelerates learning and the flow of learning uh, as long as we can get learning to flow between those little meetings. And so we've got a model of backstand. I want to talk about the practical aspects of that, but that's for next week's session. Um, Great, uh, but from your oh. perspective, you're saying that face-to-face -face is, Zoom would count as face-to-face -face if we all turn on our video. And you're in a small group. But the bigger the group, group, yeah, the bigger the group, the more it's really the blowhards like me who talk and everybody else listens either in assent or in denial. Uh, I don't think we share learning that way. We have to get people aligned uh, uh, across uh, all of those little conversations, those little groups to make that really face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So if it's okay, I will move on. You know, just, just on that one, hopefully it will help people. Is um, mm. um, is it worth to say people have different different cognitive styles? So therefore, uh, our ability to learn, our ability to communicate is not exactly the same all across the board. So yes. when, when I hear something like face-to-face, -face, I'll admit I prefer face-to-face because -face I, I, I learn a lot from body language. Um, I know when somebody says something is fine or it's fine, but when they write an email, I can never never tell if it's fine or yeah. I just eat Did it they all. think it an emoticon? Um, yeah. So I, I believe it's it's a different cognitive styles, and people um, like to communicate in different ways. What you got to do is look at the group of people. It's usually easier when it's a small group. 
Mm -hmm. Work out, do you need to have a camera on? Do you have to have it off? Does emails work best? Do videos work? So um, there is, you've got to always look at that in the situation that people, you might find um, that um, people work okay without these elements around. Um, and also the other thing is it doesn't mean the other communication methods are ineffective. Um, it is always stated as a preferred. It doesn't mean the others can't work. Yeah, so um, XP uh, pioneered this idea that we're going to have a war room, we're going to write on the walls, we're going to have everybody sharing context, we're going to be stand-ups, we're going to be retrospectives. All of that came from the first blush of Agile, and it was a lot of why that first blush was revolutionary. Was we that it wasn't that we didn't want to write anything down at all. It was that we didn't want to write anything down that we didn't need to write down. So I, I think that that idea that we can read each other in person, particularly for folk who maybe they're less extroverted than yours truly, um, and they, they they expect that you can read their body language. So um, if we're going to go back first on this, I can't spend too long on any one point, but I promise we will come back. Uh, at the end, and I'm going to allow as much time as you guys like, even if I wind up dropping dead, um, uh, because I've been up since 3 a.m., because um, it's the morning in Australia. Uh, so anyway, um, I want to make certain that you all have time to feel heard, and any of these points that you go, wait a second, I'd like to take that further, we will have time for that after. So I'm going to go to the second one of these values. Um, throughput accounting over cost accounting. What on earth is that? Um, there's a bloke. Hang on. Uh, there's a bloke named Goldrat, or well, there was a bloke named Goldrat, uh, who uh, a lot of people know for the theory of constraints. And um, I think I clicked on it at all. Let's do that again. Okay. So Goldrat and the theory of constraints are well known to people. Goldrat had a problem in, with the theory of constraints. So those who don't know the theory, it basically just says that um, in, in any um, production system, there are many different uh, uh, bottlenecks, but only one bottleneck is the system bottleneck that's limiting all of the, um, the throughput through the system. And um, in business agility, we think of there being bottlenecks in the market as well as in the organization. And so we're really interested in a transformation context at identifying well, what is the learning bottleneck in the organization in a, a product context well, what is the bottleneck in terms of market constraints? Uh, I should say the constraint in terms of market bottlenecks, apologies, I get those reversed. Um, so throughput accounting gives us a really neat way to uh, measure and visualize this stuff in terms of end-to-end -end throughput, not cost accounting. Because cost accounting, Goldratt would turn up at a factory and he'd go, Oh, look, at, you can see that not much coming out of this manufacturing. He was all about manufacturing. Um, but you can see there's just a trickle coming out. And the problem is that little machine in the middle is going to ka-chunk, 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 ka-chunk. You've got all these inputs going into it, and only this trickle of output. That is your system constraint. And the managers will go, oh, Mr. Goldberg, you're brilliant. Thank you. Um, and what we'll do is we'll fire half the people who are producing stuff that's going into the chunking machine. And, That'll be great because then we will have um, uh, minimized operating expense and we'll have maximized utilization. And Goldratt would go, no, you buy another chunking machine. And the managers would say, but that doesn't minimize operating expense and maximize utilization. So he had to invent a whole different system of accounting just so he could have the conversation with them. And there's a link uh, here to... Um, to a discussion of how throughput accounting works. So I'm not going to go into detail about that. But if you're an agilist and you get anywhere near business agility, you need to understand throughput accounting and why it's superior. Um, it's not necessarily superior for reporting because obviously most corporations have to report in cost accounting terms. But in terms of management decisions, uh, it's a way to actually get them to make numbers-based rational decisions. Questions before I go on? I'll take that as a, okay, we'll look it up. Um, Pull-based delivery and change over push-based. Well, we talk about pull-based delivery. We're used to that in Agile. What's pull-based change? Most of the transformations we get involved with, uh, we get a whole bunch of external consultants to come in. We have a framework on the wall. We've got lots of rah-rah events, and we push everybody to all change at once. 
And I don't think I need to tell you that most of the time that makes a lot of money for the consultancies that, that push the change and it leaves the transformation in a steaming heap of compromise. Um, I've been involved in some large scale transformations a couple of times as strategist. And I've found that pool based works really, really well. And it's a different idea. The idea is we want to, often you can use an open space for this. In fact, often it's best. We want to cherry pick the progressives in the organization, the people who really want change, who support change, who will never resist change. There aren't that many of them, but they exist in business and design and delivery and DevOps. We want to cherry pick them. We want to get some sponsor to support making a sort of steel thread of capability and, uh, that's going to involve just those progressives, maybe a dozen people, maybe 20 people. And we want to show that if we do all of the things that we're expecting the organization to do as sort of the to be end state of the transformation, that that actually works. And we want to put metrics on it so we can measure how well it works. And then we want to split it right down the middle and backfill with more people who are maybe not quite so progressive, but they trust those progressive people. What we do is we basically grow capability at an exponential rate, and we never ask any existing teams or business streams to change. We simply pull people into the new capability, and because that capability works better, uh, which is to say not just quicker, better, and faster, quicker, cheaper, um, but more adaptable, more continuously responding to changing market conditions, well, we can actually grow capability at a rate that never produces compromise. So that's what pool based is about. And again, you'll find a link to self-propagating transformation and so on from that point in the manifesto. Does that make sense to everybody so far? Yeah, really like that fairly. Cool. Yeah. This is to avoid uh, the revolution evaporating to leave the slime of a bureaucracy. Um, I think those who've seen multiple go ahead i also think the third value is 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 the source of many many issues i've seen because um blockages that occur prioritizing the wrong work based on someone's opinion elsewhere or or um but not looking at the actual the needs of normally in product sense it's the customer but in this case it could be the needs of, of whatever the organization is focusing on it could yes. be um you know th their services their partnerships yes um and the pool will prioritize the 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 highest value item without overloading the system yes if, if that makes sense so. it, it does and we'll see some of that reflected in principles but the next point is really sort of where that goes and since i'm trying to get a, a, a breadth first overview in the first hour of this so everybody can go, oh, that's what he meant. I, I had to tune out after that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to keep going if it's okay, Cornelius. Yeah. Cool. So learning ecosystems. We define ecosystem as a network of mutual benefit. What's a learning ecosystem? Well, the idea is that it, when we are trying to induce change in an organization, there's often an us and them thing going on with the change agents and the change recipients. Um, we don't like that language too much. So what we'd like to do instead is think that what we're doing in that pull-based transformation idea is we are iteratively converting change participants into change leaders. What we want is for the organization to fire us because they don't need us anymore as external change agents. We're trying to put a wick in the candle that will then be self-sustaining. And that's why we need a bunch of metrics around it. And you might go, wait a second, I don't like that. That means I'm, I'm gonna be out of a job. Yeah, it does mean that. And it means that you can get a whole bunch of recommendations from the people who love the fact that you actually landed the transformation and you'll get more jobs. So the whole idea here is not, let's put our nose in the trough along with the full timers. Um, the idea here is let's actually give them what they want. They want business agility, the capability to adapt to changing market conditions. That's why we got hired by a change sponsor, I guarantee. They didn't hire us because they want a scrum. They, they might go, well, a scrum's what I've heard of, so I hope that it does that thing. But from their point of view, agility is business agility. So learning is fundamental to this. We have to get the organization into a shape where it can learn continuously. 
from changing market conditions and make decisions rapidly. If we make a decision once every three months, that doesn't qualify. If we have a command and control hierarchy that makes the decision for us, that doesn't qualify. How can we measure the quality of a learning ecosystem? This is where we have some simple metrics. I'll, I'll rattle off a few of them. Uh, there's more to say. We will talk about this more when we get to the Camelot model stuff next week. Um, what's the maximum meeting size that the organization has to have for any decision in the organization to be made? If it's, well, we have a steering committee of 250 people, or we have a, 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 a PI meeting of 150, honk, that's not uh, descaled. That's not gonna be an efficient, continuous learning ecosystem. If uh, maximum meeting size is six, which you can do, and we'll show you how next week. Um, and by the way, we have some games that go with that. We're gonna be running in March and you will all have invitations to attend for free. We call it the Game Without Thrones. Be plugged for next month. Um, the idea with this is we don't actually need to have more people in a room at a time than we need, even if the room means email, even if the room means Slack, whatever the channels are, we don't need more people to align with one another than we can comfortably do in a reasonable amount of time so that we can continuously respond to changing market conditions. So learning ecosystems over training hierarchies, as with the Agile Manifesto, we're not saying any of the items in white are, uh, are bad. Command and control is useful. The cost accounting is useful. Push-based transformation is useful. Training hierarchies are useful. We're saying that the stuff in red there is um, more valuable. And if we leave that out, then all of the, in this last piece, then we have this idea of um, shuhari that most people have heard of in a training hierarchy context. It actually comes from the history of Japanese tea. There's a bloke named Fuhaku who came up with Shuhari uh, in a book called Fuhaku Hiki, which is jottings of Fuhaku. And it was all about how we have to stop those bloody upstarts from opening new tea schools. We have to have the authentic tea schools that'll teach the authentic tea method. Well, before Fuhaku invented Shuhari, uh, for the samurai of his day, um, for about 200 years before, there was another principle that was invented by a bloke named Rikyu. And Rikyu was the guy who invented Japanese tea. And he invented it as a way of fixing the Sengoku period, a period of violent multi-party civil war that infected all of Japan for 200 years. And you wouldn't think that changing the way tea is served could do that but it did in the same way. You wouldn't think that the Agile Manifesto could change the way that business is run, but it does. Um, so in the sense uh, that Agile is a tea service, this idea of Muhin Shu, it literally means um, no host and no guest, but you can think of it as no teacher, no student. We want to share learning. It doesn't matter whether I'm sitting here with gray hair or not. Uh, if you've learned something, I can learn from you. Um, if those who attended the, the, the patron session saw the patrons kicking ideas back and forth, uh, that's what we want. We want that kind of learning stuff. If we say, well, this is the one way to do it, and you've got a certificate, now you can go and work, and we'll bless you because we're re-level, well, then we're full of shit. You'll pardon my French. Um, so Muhin Shu is where we started with this Agile stuff on the C2 looking. That initial bloom of Agile the reason it went everywhere was because of moving shoe. And then when the frameworks and the certificates started, well, that's kind of died down. Now in a COVID world, we can't Say again? Say again. Ah, so is there something you wanted to add or shall I unmute you? Okay. All right. So, um, Right, which brings us to descaling principles. Now, these principles are based mainly on the permaculture principles. Permaculture is something I should talk about a little bit, but it's worth mentioning that if you look through the principles of the permaculture manifesto and the principles, the 12 principles of the Agile manifesto, if you're not aware, the Agile manifesto is more than just four values. Um, if you look at the principles of the Agile manifesto, 
you'll see the correspondence with the permaculture means. There's no question some of the guys in that room actually knew about the permaculture manifesto with the fact that they didn't give them a reference and that you're just hearing about it now from me that's just a bit sad so i encourage you to follow the link to the permaculture manifesto there and trace things back and go oh, they've completely done violence to the permaculture manifesto damn them um so far we haven't had anyone do that but that's not to say that we're not full of crap or you want to support of something where we need to trace things through differently i encourage you to do that please for those who are not aware of it permaculture is a movement that started in australia that's very popular and global and it's gone mainstream agriculture in many parts of the world because now we can do things with drones that when uh holmgren and um mollison came up with permaculture in the 70s could only be done on small holding human intensive farms it's all about sustainability how do we get a farm that is as sustainable as a rainforest they started thinking about farms as food forests uh, where you would be continuously harvesting as the seasons change you would continuously harvesting things from your food forest and you'd use an absolute minimum of pesticides and fertilizers and so on there's a lot to say about how permaculture works that i'm not going to touch on here if you get interested in it, I'd love to have the conversation with you. They're just ping. For now, I'm going to go through these principles from our perspective as agilists working in corporate farms um, and see whether we can make them more humane and sustainable by thinking in these principle terms. When it comes to the praxis that goes with this stuff, uh, as I said, we're going to be talking about the Camelot model and its practice patterns next week. So um, we will go into much more detail then. And in addition to going to the practical stuff uh, next week, um, we've got a series of games running called the Games Without Thrones um, and that you'll be able to take part in in, in March, um, which again puts practical teeth in these things. But for now, we're going breadth first. We're just going to look at these principles as does this actually cover the intent? Does it cover the ground? Everybody okay so far? Okay. So the first of these, and pardon me for squinting, uh, directly responsible individuals, business, design, and tech stakeholders make decisions together as peers to build solutions that meet each other's constraints. In the Agile Manifesto, in addition to um, the, the principle that Sheila uh, was pinging on about face-to-face, -face, we also have this lovely principle that business and technology work together on a daily basis well, where does that happen in modern agile? We've got scrum masters and product owners keeping those guys apart. We've got these PI planning meetings where they see each other once every three months. That's not a daily basis. We've lost something. In Lean UX, they have this idea that there are business stakeholders and design stakeholders and technical stakeholders that get together continuously. That's beautiful, but it ought to be the norm. It, it, it's really fundamental to business agility that we actually get together as peers. Now, the trouble is there's power relationships involved and there's silos involved and people have reasons for not wanting to give those things up. So this comes back to the question of how do we motivate the business guys to collaborate like that? And the answer is we put together reward models where it's in their interest to collaborate like that. Um, and if if you um, haven't gone and seen it yet, there's a lovely site by a fellow named Nick Case called The Evolution of Trust. You can Google that and you will see how we can change behaviors by changing reward models in really simple mathematics. But that applies across the board to the organization we work with. And if you want something more practical than a bunch of John Nash math, even beautifully animated, there's something called open book management that you can look up. And uh, there's a particular part of it called the great game of business that's uh, worthwhile plugging as well. The lovely thing about those things is they give us simple practical ways to motivate this kind of um, direct collaboration between business design and technology, even in businesses like hamburger joints. We have a gentleman named, named Darswell Rogers involved in Hexcale Alliance and Darswell's son uh, has a fast food franchise and they're applying this stuff to flip them burgers and it works. Um, so, so we've got to apply to software too, if you happen to be in that business. 
Um, everything that we're about here is uh, it applies to software businesses. Most businesses are software businesses in one way or another, but it applies to all kinds of business, and that's the intent. That first phrase, directly responsible individuals, that's something that we get from Steve Jobs, from Apple under Jobs. Um, and there's a praxis that goes with that, that's part of what we'll be talking about in Camelot model, but the basic is, as individuals working in teams, in agile teams, we're used to saying, well, I'm gonna work on that story. Um, that story usually forms part of a feature that we would really like to have a, a coherent design, and we'd like to have someone who's a directly responsible individual for that. And that feature, if we're part of some kind of epic that usually has a business context in terms of why we would want to deliver some features, whose behavior we're trying to change by delivering, how we want to change their behavior, and then find what we have to do to change that behavior. Uh, that's sort of the goiko adzik normal form for an epic. Um, well, we want direct responsibility for each of these items. But the beautiful thing about that is then somebody who owns that responsibility actually has an oar in the water about whether this thing succeeds or not. So the lovely thing about this idea of collaborating from the point of view of directly responsible individuals is everybody understands where they're coming from, where their necks are stuck in, where, what they care about. And when we have the conversation, we can then talk about, well, do we actually, as a business, care about that if we have that open book reward model in place? Lots more to talk about there in a practical sense. That's sort of where the principle's coming from. Everybody okay so far? Okay. Number two, capture and store learning in small self-organizing teams. As these work with current constraints, they become capable of opening future bottlenecks. What about wikis? What about databases? What about specs? What about all these documents? Surely that's where we store learning. No. Anyone who's actually uh, picked up a project that a previous team had been promoted for failing at knows that no, we don't read their specs. No one ever reads their specs. Those databases, those wikis, they just they're just thrown aside. Maybe someone skims it and goes, oh, yeah, no, I understand how this piece of software here worked uh, before we started hacking on it. That's really useful. Maybe the tests are a good way to document system behaviors. But that's not the learning that's behind those behaviors. Why does the system behave like that? That's something we store in our human conversations in teams. And when we treat people as sausages in the sausage factory, and we go, well, we can now, uh, we've got a new project that's for the same product. And we're gonna have a new team that's gonna work on that project. And the old people who worked on the old project, well, some of them got promoted and some of them got moved into other teams and some of them got fired. And some of them were consultants, we don't know who they are. We lost huge amounts of learning when we let those people go. Make sense so far? Okay, so in some ways, this stuff is just common sense. I mean, everyone knows this, but when it comes to the people who make the decisions, they fail to observe these principles over and over and over again. So for some people who are not us, this is a big deal. And so coaching this kind of principle into an organization is also a big deal. Okay, to move on. Yeah. Number three. Work on outcomes. Teams continuously prioritize the current bottleneck, quantify their contributions to top line business throughput and minimize working progress. Actually, I think there's a word wrong there. It should be current constraint in, in um, uh, the theory of constraints type. But that's sort of the, the, the constraint is the, the biggest bottleneck or the, the dominant bottleneck in the system. So I think that word's wrong. As I said, this is still work behind the ears. But work on outcomes. How do we prioritize the current constraint in market terms? I'm not, I'm not gonna be this interactive because we're trying to do this in the breadth first part in, in, in an hour, um, but uh, we, we will re return to this if you want. There's a bunch of metrics called the pirate metrics. The reason they're called the pirate metrics uh, is um, uh, the acronym is R. Um, they they were invented um, uh, by uh, oh, 
I know I'm tired, but I can't remember names. A guy who ran uh, an incubator called 500 Startups in San Francisco who kept getting dud, um, bad uh, uh, business plans across his desk. Um, it's Dave somebody, I know the dude. Yeah, it's killing me, it doesn't matter. I, I, it'll kill me. Uh, anyway, um, the idea is R stands for acquisition, activation, retention, referral, and uh, Dave, whose now last name I can't remember, is killing me. Dave's last R uh, was uh, revenue, but we'd like to make it return because return could be learning. Um, it, there's lots of things return could be. It's the reason that it's worth doing uh, a, um, a an ecosystem uh, or a, a business of some sort uh, at all. So these metrics, you need to be able to acquire people into your business ecosystem before they can be activated. That's to say you have to give them some value. You uh, need to activate them before you can retain them. That's to say you need to know who they are well enough that you can actually build someone for their behavior. You, you need to retain them before you're going to get re referrals and you need all of that before you're going to get returns. So this defines the most general formulation of uh, a uh, uh, a business ecosystem. Um, and the lovely thing about this is we can say, well, one of those is going to be your constraint at any one point in time. There might be other things that are your constraint too, but we can actually measure and quantify those things. So if we want to work on outcomes and continuously prioritize the current constraint and quantify teams' contributions to top line business throughput, we can quantify it in those terms. And that gives us a beautiful way, and along with the, the gold rat formulation of throughput, it gives us a beautiful, which we apply to return, gives us a beautiful way to say, okay, let's reprioritize. You know, we have product owners and they get very wedded to the existing priorities. They have had a lot of meetings with, um, with our uh, business stakeholders. And in those meetings, um, our product owners uh, they've had a lot of battles. So they don't want to continuously be prioritized. We lose all of our business agility because of that. So if we are not going to continuously be prioritized, we're doomed. We need to have metrics that everybody shares that will help us understand what the current constraint is. Now we've got all of eight minutes in the first left in the first hour. So I'm going to go along and you can stick around or not, depending on what you want. I'm not going to hurry because I think that hurrying doesn't help. Um, but um, uh, we will have we do have a recording of all of this so uh, if you feel like you got shortchanged you can listen to the recording um so i'm going to keep going if everybody's okay all right um that last bit uh quantify the contributions to top line business throughput and minimize work in progress well obviously we, we love minimizing work in progress in agile we're used to that but um Quantifying contributions to top line business throughput, that's this whole idea of measuring outcomes. If we just measure velocity for a team and we don't measure its contributions to business throughput, honk, that's a big fail when it comes to generating business agility. We have to be on the hook for the outcome. Um, and all the intermediary measures might be useful in helping the informer estimates, but it's really the outcome that matters. And uh, I can count the number of teams I know that measure their productivity in terms of outcomes. Well, there's the ones that I've influenced and it's the ones coaches in x lines have influenced, but 99, well, let's say 95% um, of uh, agile teams aren't on the hook this way. They have rag status, as far as we're concerned, not you know, rag status, red, amber, green. We care about rag status blue which is to say we want to actually measure business report up on that point. Any questions before I go on? Okay. Um, so I do encourage people to unmute and to share their videos because I think it helps for people to see each other's faces and I guess on way too much. So it's, it's really helpful for other people to see, oh, look, there's humans out there. Um, and, and don't, unless you've got real background noise that's going to interrupt us, do feel free to, to unmute as well. Um, I would much rather feel like we're all in the same room if possible. And since I can't see all your faces at the same time, at least hearing the breathing helps my morale. Um, 
Okay, so um, let's see. Next one. Uh, align small groups of teams into self-managing business streams that continuously adapt their work priorities to changing market feedback. Whoa, self-managing? We just stepped off the edge of the agile world. How do we get self-management to happen? Does that mean we have to fire all the middle managers? They're not gonna let themselves be fired, we're doomed. Um, no, we don't, we're not gonna go fire the middle managers. They're incredibly useful people. They have been promoted for being really clever and really wise and understanding where the bodies are buried and we want them on side. So self-management has to be about this idea of alignment. To get self-management to happen, we're going to need to get everybody's voice to contribute to decisions. We have our little practice pattern we're going to go into depth on next week, or practice pattern language, which is a toolkit. This idea of a pattern language is always too fancy language for, for just, it's just a toolkit. Um, call it leadership as a service. It has three simple patterns in it. Directly responsible individuals are one of those patterns. Um, so the, the idea is um, we want to change the way meetings work. So then instead of going, okay, there's our manager. We have to influence our manager to make the right decision. Instead of doing that, the manager gives up just a little bit of power. They get to be the chairman of the meeting or the speaker, if you're thinking in, in, in terms of... Uh, uh, Horton and Shawnee stuff, but let's leave the Horton and Shawnee out of it for a moment. If you don't know who Horton and Shawnee are, we'll talk about them next week as well. Um, but we want the manager still to be the manager. But what we want is that if everybody else disagrees with the manager, they overrule the manager. If the manager can give up just that much power, they can't lead by influence. If they have to use their authority to overrule everybody else, that's a problem. Now, there are some cultures where that won't fly. That's okay. We can say, well, the manager still is going to have to bless the decision that we'll have a little speaker of the house internally to our group before we actually propose something to the manager. If the manager just doesn't listen to uh, anything his team says, well, his or her team says, then that manager is bloody stupid and they're going to wind up turfed out anyway. Um, so this idea of self-management is about how we get our little teams to align with one another or get representatives to do that. Ooh, does that mean Scrum of Scrums? We all hate Scrum of Scrums. Scrum of Scrums doesn't work. It's never worked. It's always been bloody time consuming and stupid and difficult. Um, no, it doesn't mean Scrum of Scrums. Uh, there are ways to get people to align across groups uh, that are time tested, that work. And the best of them is known as quality circles. So what we really want is to get representatives of quality circles to get together and try to align. And if you think about Spotify uh, chapter meetings, uh, it's really just an adaptation of quality circles. And if you don't know either of those things, the stuff we'll talk about next week. Everybody okay to get to go on or any questions so far? That's good. I have an issue. Yes, go ahead. Here. When you talk about having the team being able to override the manager, if everyone has the same set of information, that might make sense. But a lot of times the manager has strategic information they're not at liberty to share with the rest of the team. Yes. So this is where directly responsible individuals becomes critically important. The idea is, um, in leadership as a service, that um, if the team is not unanimous in its opposition to one of the team members, well, then that team member as a directly responsible individual, in this case, directly responsible for strategy, um, well, then they get to make the decision. Simple. Now, that's not always going to work. There are many organizations and many contexts where the manager has to be able to overrule. That's fine. The idea is these are practice patterns. We only apply a pattern when it solves a problem, not when it creates one. So if I say good, Jim? Well, I guess it's the same concern I had with the other concern I brought up that a lot of these things sound good when you use them as a guideline, but they tend to get carved in stone in a lot of organizations. Yeah. So once you say this, unless everybody understands that this is, that there are exceptions. Yes. 
it, it sort of the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Absolutely it. agree. And that's where you get things like the Zappos experience of holacracy. I'm not knocking holacracy per se or any of the patterns in it, but when you take it as an absolute, and they lost what, 20% of their staff because uh, they said, well, this is the way we do things. And if you don't like it, hit the road. Um, so, and that was in one year. So um, I completely agree with you. And that's part of the reason why we're calling the practices that go with this stuff, um, the Camelot model, because of that quote out of uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. It's only a model. It's something to be dispensed with when it doesn't suit you. And the practices, you don't have to do all of them or you don't have to do them exactly as written. They're only a way of saying, hey, there are some well-proven solutions to some of these problems. If they don't suit you, don't do them. Maybe you need to put that quote at the bottom of the page. Okay. Model. Beautiful. I well, shall what's do. Interesting, you know, what's interesting on that, Peter, is um, people forget what principles are uh, at times. Principles are things that guide you. It guides your decisions. It guides your thoughts. When you do something, the principles help you. It's, it's, it's not a rule or the law of the land, but if you can get as close as possible, then things get better. So a lot of people have principles they put in place, um, but they're not there yet. These are, they'd like to get to the point where they live and breathe all the principles. Yes. So absolutely you will have exceptions, but um, well, these are quite. I also want to back up Sheila on the fact that we're talking about stuff that is off the map for a lot of agile. So we have to be experimental about this. And that mm -hmm. Game Without Thrones game that we are running in March and that we've been running for the last five years, um, we've run this for groups up to, the biggest we've done was 110 in Toronto in 2018. Uh, back when we could get together in a single room, we did it with Lego. Now we do it online electronically with Miro and Discord. But um, the neat thing about running these as experiments on small scale is that we don't actually need this self-management stuff to happen for a whole organization. If we can get it to work for just a single program, maybe 60 people, maybe 100 people, that's already a mighty leap forward. So if we play with it experimentally and go, well, this stuff works for us, this stuff doesn't. I'll give you an example. Um, uh, Kamad Atatran is one of the XL coaches took uh, this idea into college board. And they don't have, uh, they have all silent, they don't have any cross-functional teams. So they adapted it so that uh, the quality circles were really how they were able to get these silos to uh, represent at a decision-making council and they rotated people to that council. Um, at the same time, the manager could still overrule, but they got a flow of learning they didn't have before and they love it. So uh, looking at it as something where uh, we can do this on a small scale, we don't need to do this for a whole organization. This is not push, this is pull. And we'll only apply the stuff that we need to solve the problems we have. If YAGMI is fundamental, those who are not familiar with XP, you aren't going to need it. You either need it right now or don't do it right now. That's kind of the fundamental. And we actually have that in the principles too. So that's coming up. So Peter, is it, is it worthwhile saying that um, on that case, if the manager or the, 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 the leader who knows the strategic mission that he's not for some bizarre reason allowed to share with the people executing the work. Um, if he always overrules every decision they make, then there's a fundamentally a bigger problem that you need to solve. Where if it's the yeah. red herring, that might be okay. Uh, I'd expect a good leader to convince me, trust me on this one, I can't tell you why, but we've got to do it. Um, even, if, even in societies where you do have this form of culture where it's basically uh, the top can't overall the bottom. The best example is the Haudenosaunee, which if you're not aware, this is a uh, 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 First Nations people who um, uh, use something called the Great Law of Peace for about eight centuries that worked this way. But they still had war chiefs. And if you've got some people coming over the hills shooting spears and arrows at you on, on horses, uh, you don't have time to sit down and have a, a nice inclusive, all everyone gets accounted for a uh, council meeting, uh, someone's got to call the shots right then and there, and there's no time to do anything else. And that's why managers are really useful. They are our war chiefs. And sometimes we call them scrum masters, sometimes we call them product players, whatever. But we have to have the ability to say, when in trouble or in doubt, that guy over there or that girl over there um, 
uh, they, they get to make a decision. And that's where directly responsible individuals comes in. Whether they get one or another title is a different question. I want to move on if that's okay with everyone. That's fine. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, um, number five, reward mutual benefit across business streams to reduce silos, wastes, and missed opportunities and share resources, services, and learning. How do we reward mutual benefit? Well, we're not used to it. We're used to this idea that there are KPIs or OKRs, and if you fulfill those, then you've done your job. And we often see, uh, you know, there's one team that's under a lot of time pressure and they're hard at it. They don't get to see their, their spouses or their children uh, for months on end. There's another team that had a, an easier time reaching whatever their, um, their, their point was and outcome was. And they go, oh, fellas, we feel so sorry for you. Bye. And they go and they have a weekend and they go have holidays and they see their kids and everything is good. And they know that maybe next month they'll be the ones under time pressure. But there's no motivation for them to go, oh, crap, that's going to really impact the business. And I get rewarded based on business throughput. So that's going to affect my bonus. I better help them. So this idea of open book management is incredibly powerful. And the fact that most agilists have never heard of it is incredibly sad. Um, we have been doing a bit too much uh, shuhari and a bit too little Muhin Shu. I'm not saying shuhari is bad, but without Muhin Shu, yeah, it's bad. So um, this notion of rewarding mutual benefit does not mean we have to storm into HR and go, right, I want an employee share options program and I want it now. Uh, we can do this with really simple things. So, for example, I uh, was strategist for uh, transformation at Commonwealth Bank of Australia. About 50,000 people. It's the biggest banking group in Australia, which is to say tiny by uh, Northern Hemisphere standards. Um, but um, I had one really wonderful general manager, Rob Webb, um, uh, who uh, I did some work for in digital channels. And the way we did things there, Rob simply said, look, if you guys are able to hit these business objectives, I am going to buy pizza for everyone. If you hit these ones, I'm going to take you all out to the one star, well, the one hat restaurant downstairs for a dinner. If you hit these ones much harder, I'm going to take everybody and their spouse out with my discretionary budget, which I'm not going to spend on what I usually spend it on. I'm going to take them all out to a two hat restaurant downtown. And if you hit these ones, the CIO is going to take you on the next corporate retreat. And the CIO did too, because that program won the award in 2012, the best program in the bank. Um, so this idea of rewarding mutual benefit means that we start challenging the people with the big ties and saying, yeah, sorry, I don't care what your title is. That's going to affect my... my uh, my bonus, I'm actually going to challenge you on that in a respectful way. It's hard to do, harder to do in non-Australian cultures. I accept that. Uh, Aussies have an easier time being abrupt with one another. It's kind of baked in. We call it mateship. Let's not talk about that now. I'm going to move on if it's okay with everyone. Is that, um, just real quick, is that a way to, um, to also get everybody involved and to optimize the whole? Yes. Essentially? Yeah. Yes. Because if we're measured by the outcome of the whole, then our team's velocity or lack of velocity this month or this week or whatever it is, I don't care. What I care about is, are we actually going to get 500,000 people using our app in three months? If it's 50 people, I care about that. That sucks. That's the bottleneck I care about. I don't care about, oh, gee, you know, this little team, they went really fast. They worked really hard. They're all stressed out. I don't care about that at all. What I want is for all of us to be motivated to collaborate together to achieve the business outcome. That's business agility. Okay. How, how do you prevent when you're talking about this type of uh, goal setting yeah. and goal changing? How do you prevent a certain cannibalism between different parts of the organization? So that's where we get back to descaling. Um, so there are ways to set up rewards for particular teams and streams and portfolios and before we get to a, 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 a whole organization level. But 
Um, cannibalism usually is about budgets. And so to do this, uh, the open book management idea is, and this is, I'm not talking stuff that's la la land. This is how Apple worked under jobs. There was a single budget. The CFO controlled it and everybody drew from it. And so the idea of cannibalism, that we're going to exploit your team because that's going to be good for our ability to make our KPIs, to get our rewards, um, that's actually part of the problem that we're trying to solve rather than part of the solution. There's a lot longer conversation to have on that though. So I, I encourage you to come along to the more practice focused session that we've got next week uh, on the Camelot model and, um, and we'll, we'll work through that a little bit more. Everybody okay so far? Okay, uh, so uh, number six, mercilessly refactor business streams. Reuse, recycle, or reduce all the resources the stream produces. So all contribute to top line throughput and none go to waste. That's an awful lot of words. Let's start with the most difficult of them. Uh, refactor. Uh, back in XP days, um, I'm an old extremo. Uh, refactor means improve the design of existing systems without changing their functionality. And it was usually about eliminating duplicates and unnecessary dependencies and making the code self-documenting and so on. And the notion was we had to do this mercilessly. Uh, there is um, some lip service to refactoring in things like, uh, I'll actually name it, uh, safe. Um, but um, merciless refactoring? No, they, safe says that refactoring is something you have to prioritize and schedule and, and get the approval of the business to do any refactoring. Um, the idea of merciless refactoring is this is a discipline. And if we don't take that discipline on, then the cost of change goes through the roof. And that's as true for organizations as it is for code. We need to be mercilessly refactoring our organizations. How do we go about doing this refactoring work? Well, uh, if you come along to next week's session, you'll have some ideas about it, but there's more to say. Uh, nevertheless, this idea of refactoring is that, well, we have duplication of effort. We have teams with overlapping responsibilities or streams with overlapping markets. And if we can't refactor in such a way that we're going to account for that, well, we're not going to get the kind of business agility we need. One, one hand of our business isn't going to know what the other hand's doing. Um, so then this neat thing about um, we, we want this to happen so that business streams uh, will reuse, recycle, or reduce all the resources they produce. So all contribute to top line throughput and none go to waste. I'll give you a, a concrete example, although you can obviously think of something like Amazon where they went, hey, we've got all of this extra provisioning of servers so that we can have the quality of service that we need to have. Uh, maybe we can use all that extra, extra provisioning to offer something we'll call Amazon Web Services. That'll use all those extra servers and maintain our quality of service. And well, now today, Amazon Web Services is worth more to Amazon than their entire retail operation that those servers were intended to supply. Um, there's lots of other examples, but um, if you can't think of any, then there's a long conversation out there too. But basically this idea is, if we have some resources we're producing going to waste, well, either we can say, well, let's not produce those, or we can say, well, let's put them to use for some other customer. Let's reuse them. Or we can say, well, let's find a way to take advantage of them ourselves. So if we can't do that, well, that's when we have to eliminate them. We well, might go, well, that just means uh, lean. Lean says we have to get rid of uh, seven wastes. No, this is waste in a much more concrete business sense. It's just, Stuff. When we're producing stuff, it isn't wasteful in terms of slowing down our productivity. It's wasteful in terms of us not making full use of it. I'm going to go on to point seven. Um, okay, so design breadth first. Step back and see patterns uh, in and between markets and value streams. These inform designs we can only detail as we learn more. That's a big bloody deal because we have people all over the world who are dealing with long story backlogs. 
We call them product backlogs, but they're full of all your little ticky-tacky stories. We've analyzed the shit out of these things that we're talking about, French. And a lot of those stories will never get prioritized to the point where we actually do something about them. They'll just sit there getting pushed down the backlog. We're wasting a lot of our analysis. There is another way to do things. And again, it observes that old XP principle of the agony. You aren't going to need it. We don't need to break an epic down into features unless we need to plan a release of those features. So there's a whole bunch of epics that simply don't need to be broken down into features yet. They're not relevant to the current constraint, market constraint for our business. Yes, they are important, but we don't need to break them down yet. Likewise, there are features we don't need to deliver yet. We don't need to deliver a feature yet. Why would we break it down into stories? You aren't going to need those stories. You break this feature down when you need them. We work breadth first. And the beautiful thing about this is that then when, th when change happens and you know change will happen and this year and last year is happening right under our feet right now, well, we can actually adapt to it because we don't have too many bloody artifacts to change. We work breadth first to be able to do that. So uh, this idea of design breadth first, step back to see the patterns in and between markets and value streams. These informed designs we can only detail as we learn more on point seven. Well, we have to be able to uh, take our new priorities and use those in context. So if we don't have a breakfast view of our market, or if we're talking about a change program, our market is the organization we're in. We don't have that and maintain it breakfast. We are gonna get bogged down in the weeds. And then we will have used up all the budget for the transformation and we won't have got the outcome that the sponsor wanted or all of the budget for the program and we won't have got the market that the business wanted. So breadth first is critically important. How do we do that in a Kanban sense? Um, we're not gonna go into this now, but if you're interested, you can go and have a look at an article on LinkedIn I wrote called uh, 3D Kanban, where we try and apply this stuff in a concrete way. We have some more stuff coming out about that and some tools that go with it. Uh, probably not this year, but um, uh, we have a simple way to work from those pirate metrics all the way down to things at a story level without ever violating the agony and to track the life cycle of all these things in a coherent way. And you can do it yourself with cardboard on a wall. You don't need to buy any tools to do that. I'm not trying to flog you at all. We'll come back to that one again. Everybody okay with that? All right. And I should say, I'm not just watching Cornelius, but Cornelius pops up because he's the only one who's got his microphone on. So if the rest of you would like to add some stuff, do please turn your microphones on and I'll at least see you nodding or shaking your head. Okay, so number eight, collaborate rather than delegate. People and teams are in the right relationships when conversations evolve to support each other's work and learning. Um, I think you are all keenly aware of missing conversations that are in your organizations. Uh, you can see this whenever you walk into a, a team room and it's quiet. And there's a coach, you go, why aren't they talking to each other? What happened? What happened? Um, uh, if we're doing this via Zoom, again, I encourage everyone to keep their microphones on because then we can say, the conversations aren't being had. I'm not trying to read the chat. I hope you guys are having conversations in there. Um, but this idea of the conversations have to evolve to support each other's work and learning, um, that's the kind of collaboration that's important to us. When we have conversations delegated to people like Scrum Masters and product owners, uh, then that's kind of violating this principle. I'm not saying you can't have critters with those names. I'm saying don't delegate conversations to them. Let them be servant leaders. I want a product owner who's gonna be a servant leader for a meeting between business and design and technology stakeholders. I want a scrum master who's gonna be a servant leader for their team. And that's where that leadership as a service thing comes in. It gives us a praxis, a, a set of pra simple practices that the team can use to keep the scrum master honest to make certain that they can self-manage. So we will play with that in next week's session on Camelot model. I apologize if the street sweeper outside is making too much noise for you guys. Do tell me if you can't hear me. Um, okay. So number nine, 
take time to simplify and automate solutions. Simple automated systems cost less than big manual ones, taking less work to maintain business outcomes. This is another one of where it's blindingly obvious. Oh, of course, we should automate. Of course, we should simplify. But it doesn't happen. Um, Xscale Alliance published a, a, an article through me uh, last year as part of a course we're working on called Xscale DevOps. I'm not say DevOps course. Um, uh, we call it the zeroth law uh, of, of DevOps. You know, there's the, the, sorry, the zeroth way of DevOps. There's the three ways of DevOps. And it's purely this. Um, take time to simplify and automate solutions. So the trouble is the business will say, we don't have the budget for it. Well, that's where this works in with this idea of open book, that we care about outcomes. And if we don't continuously, mercilessly simplify, which is the same damn word as refactor, it's just a simpler, it's a refactored version of the word refactor. If we don't continuously, mercilessly simplify our organization, our systems, our way of going to market, then we're going to be outcompeted by people who do. Um, if we don't automate everything we can, same thing applies. We're making a rod for our own back. We're not saving someone's budget. This is why outcomes have to be our focus in business digital. Number 10, use and value experimentation. Experiment to reduce risk and adapt each product to the changing constraints of your business streams and markets. This does not mean value in the sense of, oh, we love experimentation here. No, this means let's actually work out how much it will cost us if we don't run these experiments. Let's put those costs in terms of uh, uh, um, expected monetary value. Um, the EMB calculation is a ridiculously simple way to calculate the cost of not experimenting. Let's put those costs in front of our manager and say, hey, you're saying don't run experiments. You're going to cost us all this money. Why are you wasting money, Mr. Manager? Managers have a very hard time refuting any argument that's put in terms of costs. So if we value our experiments in monetary terms, well, the EMB calculation gives us a uh, uh, this is Wayne that's in, uh, invented that, um, gives us a really simple way to make the case to the point that the manager, if they don't want to spend that out of their budget, if they have budget control, well, now they have to explain why they want to waste money. Uh, that means they have to come up with a way to value the experiment themselves. That's great. You come up with a better calculation than EMV and value this experiment. We'd love that conversation. So if I say good. Okay, um, number 11. Now we get into the really interesting ones. Enrich interfaces to serve underserved markets, the spaces between market segments are where most opportunities for innovation and productivity occur. We have business stakeholders who just care about their KPI, their silo, their particular business stream. And they don't look beyond that. Um, and we have portfolio managers they go, well, I've got all these business managers who are managing these streams. I don't need to worry about the market. Those guys are worrying about it. missing conversation. So the spaces between these things are enormously valuable. And this is where you get things like an Amazon web service is motivating people to actually think about the market, not about the current business stream. We want all of our reward models to encourage that kind of thinking. So uh, this idea of underserved markets is a really valuable idea. If we can identify segments that aren't being served, that's where you get an Uber. Uh, that's where you get an Airbnb. Uh, I'll give you a, a concrete example. Um, Domino's, the pizza guys, over the last decade, they grew faster than Facebook and Apple and Google, all put together. How did they grow faster? You'd think the pizza would be a pretty saturated market. In America, it is. They took pizza to China and India. They used exactly the same franchise models, they exactly the same supply models, all the stuff they knew how to do. They just changed the menu. In India, you get pizzas now that are full of curry. Not saying curry is good or bad, but they, they cater to the local palates. You get Sichuan pizzas in China, probably not. I think Sichuan's an invented flavor in the West, doesn't matter. Um, they changed the offering and they went into new market segments, underserved ones, because guess what? Pizza is popular everywhere. You just have to 
get people an idea that it's going to give them the flavors they like really quick. Fast food is a really valuable thing. So that's how they grew faster than the others, uh, than the other electronic market segments by looking for underserved markets. So um, number 12, transform to embrace change. Continuously adapt your organization's patterns to changing market conditions and opportunities to open new markets. This is where descaling really comes into its own. We need uh, structures that will encourage people to share learning so that they can make these sorts of changes. And to give you a metaphor, I want to talk about two of those examples and then uh, I'll open the, the floor to questions. First example, um, Yellowstone National Park in the in America. Uh, in the 19th century, they thought that it wouldn't be a very hospitable place if it was full of timber wolves. They took out all the wolves. Uh, by the end of the 20th century, um, they had a lot of ecological problems in Yellowstone. Uh, the rivers were turning into marshes and a lot of the, the little creatures, the birds and the fishes and so on, uh, they were, their populations were plummeting. And so they didn't know what to do. There was lots of debate. Finally, someone said, well, you know, Maybe it was a bad move to take the wolves out. Let's try introducing a pack of wolves, maybe a couple of dozen wolves. Let's try this experiment, see what happens. In less than five years, the wolves changed the course of the rivers in Yellowstone, which might sound unlikely to you. What happened was wolves howling at night can be heard by every herbivore in the entire park. And when the herbivores hear wolves, they change their behavior. Instead of hanging out by the water's edge and their hard hooves destroying all the habitats for little creatures and muddying the water, they go down, get a sip of water, and they run back up to the, to the hills where they can defend themselves from the wolves. They don't know how many wolves there are. So change the behavior of all the herbivores wolves in the park. This is called a tropic cascade in ecological circles. But it applies to business too. When Steve Jobs introduced iPhone, most of you guys went, oh, well, iPhone is that thing you hold in your hand. From Job's point of view, iPhone was a change in the relationship between the software developers and the telcos. And the change in relationship was, up until iPhone, every telco in the world did all the billing for software services that were on the smartphones of the day. They did all the billing on the phone bill. And then they soaked up. 80 to 95% of the retail value of the services. Jobs said to AT&T, we will give you an exclusive. We will only sell iPhone through you as long as you get out of that business. And we're gonna give 70% of the retail value to the software developers. That changed the entire world, that one contract. Because once he established it, Nokia went broke because they couldn't match that contract. Jobs was free to offer that contract to every telco in the world and every software developer in the world. And from an end user's point of view, that made a huge growing ecosystem of services to this one little device that they were willing to buy. From Apple's point of view, they got paid vastly more for the handset than for whatever 30% divot they, or even if they had taken 70% divot out of the software, they didn't care about setting up the 70%. They picked 70% for the software developers because the software developers were used to selling software that was shrink, shrink wrapped and put on shelves where the retailer would get 70%. So it reversed the equation from any software developer's point of view. A terrific cascade from that one contract ensued. So transform to embrace change. The permaculture guys emphasize there's two kinds of change. There's a change that happens in conditions like COVID that's forced on you. And it's a change that you introduce through that kind of cascade. And if you can master that, well, then you can be an Amazon. So that's the descaling principles. Um, we haven't talked about the right sizes for things. We haven't talked about the practices that go with this, but um, I'm happy to take any question and entertain any feedback for as long as you guys like, because I have made my day for you. Um, on the first principle, um, I'm just wondering, um, I've kind of read through it all forwards and backwards to try and make it all soak in. I um, was wondering why you called out business design and tech stakeholders, because they are very three specific tech stakeholders. Yes. Um, 
uh, as to something that um, may be a little bit wider. So um, the reason I ask that is imagine 10 years or 20 years from now and somebody looks upon this. Yes. Um, and maybe some of these areas, because um, business is kind of a catch-all in the sense, yes. but design and tech is a, a divide, as, as per se, or two functional kind of spaces, potentially. Yes. It could be interpreted as that. Um, and I know design is quite a big thing right now, a big supporter of design and design thinking itself. Um, but it's, um, well, it's to kind of incorporate the, the customer's view from beginning to end. Um, but we don't know what's going to happen in 10 or 20 years from now where maybe yeah. those kind of design principles are part of everyday life and we don't need to call it out separately anymore and it's baked into everything we do towards a customer. Yes. So I was wondering why those that was the three kind of um, business units um, mentioned. Is there a So you actually asked two questions there. Yeah. So I'm, going to ask, I'm going to answer the meta one first and then come back to that specific why those three. The meta one... I left out the final paragraph of the manifesto. Like the Agile and Permaculture manifestos it is based upon, we regard the above as closed to modification, but open to extension. So if in 20 years, people go, well, what about the scientists? You left out the scientists. What about the spacemen? What about the aliens? Whatever it turns out in the next 20 years. And after this year, I wouldn't put anything past anyone. And besides which the US Air Force is releasing videos of things whizzing about magically. So maybe there are aliens. Um, yeah. then let's extend this thing. To tell the truth, I think that this should be marked uh, once we've finished our conversations after the festival. I think we'll mark this 1.0 and then it can be extended by 1.1. But uh, that brings me to the specific question, why business, tech and design? Well, um, I think that's what we're used to thinking about um, as stakeholders. Uh, I would think that whether someone's called an analyst or a scientist, they kind of fit into a business context. Maybe that's uh, not stretching it far enough. And I would be delighted, Cornelius, if you've got some alternate wording you prefer, uh, let's do something offline and see about going uh, and adding that in uh, before we get to the 1.0. Uh, um, I, I mentioned at the start, we've got about 500 signatories at the moment. I encourage you guys to not sign it until you go, oh, yeah, that's, <clears throat> that's something I believe in, um, but I would love to get feedback from you to help it turn into something that you would be willing to sign. Okay, um, I'll, I'll pick my last question and then I think I've, I've, I've covered all. Um, what, it's not really a question, it's more a, uh, probably a statement. The, the last one, the 12th, transform to embrace change. Um, I'd like to think of that, um, transformation recently as more continuous transformation rather than mm -hmm. a beginning and an end. I think in the past, transformations had a starting point and an end. Yay, transformation's done, we move off. Um, and the organizations have seen that, kind of broken that view a little bit or evolved beyond it, where it's transformation is now continuous. It's, it's baked into the way we think, the way we use bold measure learn essentially to to guide our decisions and so therefore there's no end to the transformation anymore yeah so and that's why we've got um that's why we've got continuously adapt your organization's patterns to changing market conditions um so i completely agree with you um i, I think with this one um the idea of continuous transformation uh is basically saying well those scrum masters and coaches have a continuing seat at the table because we're going to need to continue to change. Um, so having a change program as a living thing uh, is, is critically important. Yeah, it's not the way I was thinking about it, to be honest. But yeah, I, I see your point because the idea of, of, of the coaches and scrum masters is fundamentally it's that to try and make yourself redundant, right? So that the continuous learning is embedded and baked into the DNA. Yeah. Um, therefore, it's not needed anymore to be coached and guided. guided. Well, that's where we have the idea of those roles as generating change leaders by being change leaders, which goes back to the original manifesto. We're accomplishing this by doing it and helping others do it. Once we've helped them do it, we no longer have a role. Um, yeah. Whether they have the title Scrum Master uh, or whether they uh, have the title Manager or whether they don't have a title at all, the whole point here is to generate a capability 
to uh, respond to changing market conditions. I'm going to leave for everybody else to ask questions. I can keep going. <laughs> Thanks, Cornelius. Somebody else? Hey, um, I had a couple of um, things, but just on Cornelius's point, I, the word transformation and transform is also something I'm trying to avoid personally because it implies an end state. Um, so we yeah. tend to favor the words like mutate, evolve, yeah. iterate. Uh, Nassim Aid has been using the word metamorphosis. Yeah. Metaphor, yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the sense of growth and and yeah, I said that iteration. Everything is iteration, right? Um, I like this a lot. This is, aligns a lot to what I've been doing. Um, but I am surprised by some things I perceive as absent to this. Cool. So, one of the things that we try and land on a lot is around um, what the standard group call like um, decision latency, right? And Boyd would have it be like loop speed, but the idea of just making decisions faster. That seems to be our, our fundamental principle behind everything on top of any other principles anywhere, just make your decisions faster. So I'm surprised to see that doesn't it come across. Yeah, you're right. Um, particularly, and then some of the other thing that seems absent to me is the uh, idea about killing dependencies, mm -hmm. particularly singling those out because they inhibit decision speed, right? Well, but that, this that's is, why is there. That's, a that's... lot about organizational yeah. facets of structure, but not it's sort of, ex it, it doesn't, it doesn't really hold the torch, it doesn't hold the candle to the feet of uh, dependencies, right? Where we've got the principle about um, uh, refactoring, uh, uh, mercilessly refactor business streams, um, I, I think that goes to that latter idea that we're doing this mercilessly continuously. And we're, what, the reason we're trying to do this is specifically not just to speed up the flow of work, but to speed up the flow of learning. Um, I, I think that's baked in. Okay, so you'd see it implicit to that. I, I guess then I just I would like to see it explicit. Yeah, I'm, I'm all for making it explicit. So if, if you can look at, at uh, six and also look at the permaculture one it's based on, um, and uh, then let's make some time, Alan, offline, or at least out of this meeting, and, and see if we can make it better. And I encourage that for all of you. If you've got a particular idea that isn't here, or one where you go, that doesn't capture it, yes, please, let's have a conversation. I, I, I don't really want to call this 1.0, until all the festival participants had a chance to go, yeah, okay, uh, except for this. So, Alan, when you do that piece of wording on on the dependencies, um, and I, I'm going to be a little bit playing devil's advocate over here on purpose because I actually spend most of my time to try and make those dependencies visible and then try and reduce them as much as possible. Um, in some large organisations, and I know we're trying to descale large organisations. Um, um, eliminating dependencies is not always possible. What you try and do is make them visible and then try and find a way to reduce them. If you can eliminate them, great. But there are some dependencies that um, will be part of your design. Um, and therefore, um, so, you know, you, you need to know that it is a yeah. necessary dependency. So, so that's, in, that's uh, in both uh, principles five and six. Say again? That's in both principles five and six. So I, I think... There's a longer conversation to have, and I'd love for the three of us to get together and have it, or anybody else here would like to be in that one. Because I posted somebody recently said, what would happen if we replace dependencies with um, partnership? There you so, go. Uh, so uh, we, okay. said, we have a dependency with, um, you know, the guys that run X system and say, we change it into a partnership. Then you look at the flow. Yes. and how much that partnership slows down your flow. And then if what you want to try and do is um, increase your flow or, or decrease your lead and cycle time, if those make yes. sense to you. So um, in, in, next week's, in next week's session, you'll see how we use yeah. quality circles and rotating councils to generate treaties, um, working agreements for mutual benefit between different working groups. And we can do this at multiple different scales uh, in a sort of fractal way as the main governance mechanism for the organization. So there's a lot of really neat, simple patterns we can introduce to do that. But in terms of principle, yeah, I think that's still baked in here. I think there's a, there's a good promise theory thing in there somewhere about obligations, if you're talking about constructing um, promises and relationships between oh, groups. Wow. But I need to learn what you are... I don't know anything about promise theory. That's interesting. Oh, it's cool. Well, go on. Can dive into that because that's that's going to absorb a lot of your time. Um, but Cornelius, you were saying about um, 
uh, these are necessary. Uh, I just, I can't, I can't agree with that. It's a, it's a constant evolution, right? Just as you can't be agile, you just yeah. do more. Absolutely. I think this is the same thing. You can remove dependencies and you should just be hostile to them. That dependency exists now and we can reduce it, improve it, but let's not ever tolerate it. Let's just say it's, it's not yeah. our biggest problem at the moment. I'd suggest that making them explicit and in particular cycles of dependency, making those explicit mm -hmm. Uh, in organizational structure and in uh, software structure is critical to getting good design and refactoring those things so that we have the simplest design that could possibly work for our organization. Uh, that's getting back to XP ideas. So, yes. And so, systems thinking, right? It's because it's the best. It's, this is today's ideal, but tomorrow's ideal is emergent and we don't even know what that's going to be. We can't yeah. possibly yeah. say that yeah. this is acceptable forever. Uh, absolutely. Can I give you an example of what I was thinking when I was... Oh, just, just hold on one moment, Cornelius, so I can follow Alan's idea. Um, yeah. So um, these principles began under the title ecosystems thinking principles. Um, so the idea of an ecosystem as a network of mutual benefit, if we think of the organization we work with as such a network then uh, descaling is really trying to factor it into pieces that are going to have these conversations that support each other's learning and work, but minimize the third legs involved, both within each of the teams and in the communications between them. And that's where there are some patterns we can exploit. So there's a longer conversation on that, a practical conversation we'll be having in next week's Camelot model session. Okay, anybody who isn't Alan or Cornelius? <laughs> Sheila, I'm reserving my comments until after next week's session on those two. Beautiful, Sheila. Uh, you're, you're remarkably patient, but if you want to raise them with me before, then I would be all for it. So uh, just drop Well, that could take hours. Okay. <laughs> I have hours. I'm, I'm, I'm now just okay. the, the founder of an of a ecosystem. I am not a working coach. So you've got something uh, and you've got time. I've got time. I think it'd be better after. It depends on what you actually cover in the session next week. Life is good, Sheila. No worries. Okay. Anybody who isn't Sheila, Alan, or Cornelius? Yep. All right, anybody who is Sheila or Alan or Cornelius, or should we wrap it up there? I think it's been really good. I mean, I'll, 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 I'll probably connect, I'll connect with you guys offline um, and we can, we can talk this topic through. It's, 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 um, it's really good. Um, there is probably the, the fourth value is one that I think wasn't that, that clear when I first saw it and after you described it, so maybe that's something worth thinking of. Um, I like the fourth value. It's just, it needs to make sense maybe to someone else who doesn't know cool. what it's about. Um, but it's a really good session. Thank you very much. Fantastic, folks. All right. Thank you all for coming. And uh, I'll put the recording up as soon as possible. Thank, Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Take care. Take care all.